our speaker today is someone who is very, 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 very special to me. I can honestly say that through about, I can't think of any trial in my life that was super, super hard that this man did not show up and make a difference. And I know many of you can say the same. He has a knack, he hears the Holy Spirit, and he shows up. And I'm so thankful for Pastor David Gibson. Can we give him a big round of applause here? Because we love him. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Now, I've got a, a two things I'm going to do today. The Lord showed me something this morning when I was worshiping God. You know, if you worship God like this, you're like a T-Rex. If you worship God like this, you're like a funnel. And so God doesn't drop anything like he's pouring into you. So I would encourage you, worship God like a funnel. And just let him pour everything into you that he wants to, okay? He, he brings things on purpose for our lives every time we assemble together. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be. Not maybe show up, there will I be. So be a funnel. Don't be a T-Rex. Don't say, God, I don't want to, I've got my fist up here, don't give, put nothing in my hand. I don't want nothing, God, from you. No, be, be a funnel. Now, I want to do one other thing before I preach today. And I'm excited. I've been preaching for weeks. <clears throat> really for 53 years. That's a lot of weeks. But I feel like I'm supposed to make a public word Give a public word to you, Lacey, that I spoke to you earlier. Lacey, I want you to stand so people can identify you. This is Lacey Kitchen, one of our young people, and uh, in whom her mom and dad are well pleased. She serves in our armed forces and is being deployed into Germany this week. <clears throat> Thank you, Lacey, for serving our country. That's good. That is good. Awesome. Awesome. Now, I want to identify, I want to give an identification to your clap. Every time you heard that, was somebody saying, I love you. Somebody saying, I'm behind you. Somebody saying, I'm praying for you. I went to Lacey. Now, you may be seated. I just want to make sure people identified you. I went to Lacey right after we prayed for her, and I felt like God showed me something, that, that being deployed in Germany was going to be a time of a deep dive for her in her relationship with God. It's a time when all of the other distractions are going to be away. It's going to be in a foreign country. A deep dive is something that you don't take, usually, a huge crowd with you. You, you go there by yourself or maybe one or two other people as a diving partner. Uh, there are beautiful things that you see in a deep dive, but also can be a place that can be frightful. I want you to know the Lord is with you. And in that deep dive, you're going to go into a deeper experience with God. You're going to find some treasures on your own. Mom and Dad have planted treasures in your life, but you're going to find some lacy on your very own that's going to be the compass for the rest of your life. You believe that with me, church? We're going to believe that. Amen. I only do that for the glory of God because I want to encourage her to make sure that she is diving deep. When she feels alone, dive deep. When you feel by yourself, dive deep. And whatever you do, don't swim in the shallow where the sharks feed. Hallelujah. Amen. God is good. Turn with me in your Bibles today to the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, I feel like God has given me a word uh, to share today, and I, I've, been, I've been breathing, in, I've been inhaling and exhaling this word in my spirit for several weeks now. God has surely been up to some awesome things in our church, and I want us to pray, and we're going to just believe God to speak to our hearts. I want to say this to you, every one of you, you're not here by accident. If you have an ear to hear, God's going to speak to you. All right, now if you're here wishing that you'd heard, Pastor Paul was here, guess what? He ain't. Uh, but I ordained him, 
And he's a great pastor, and I love him. And uh, the, 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 I'm just excited about things that God does in this church. It's my favorite playground. Oh, hallelujah. But I want us to pray. And then we're going to get to the Word, and I'm going to lay some foundation. I'm going to get to the Word of God tonight, today. Father, I thank you so much for the anointing of God that I have felt throughout, Lord, this week. For this season and this moment and this time. God, I am not here by accident. I'm here by your appointment. I've been assigned this place in life. And God, I'm grateful for the blessings of God. I humbly, Lord, ask you today to speak into all of our hearts. I ask you, God, to make yourself clear, Lord, to everyone in this place today. There are some under the sound of my voice that have, Lord, wondered why they are where they are. And God, they have asked, why am I here? They have asked, Lord, where are you? Uh, Because they have not found you in this this place where they are. But God, I want you to reveal to them today that no matter where they are in life, they cannot hide from you. You know exactly where they are. You have them marked. And you desire, Lord, to speak into their lives today. So I pray today in Jesus' name for an anointing that makes preaching easy and fun. I pray today, God, that everything that doesn't need to be said will be just extracted from me. And I only speak the word you want spoken today. Lord, I don't need the expertise of a surgeon. I need the expertise of the Holy Ghost. So touch me today in Jesus' name. Amen. This word today is going to be a prophetic word I feel to this church and to you that are here. You're not here accidentally. And uh, and I say that that humbly before God, but I know what God has said to me and and how he has unfolded these things. Since uh, January, I have asked the Lord to recalibrate me, uh, to realign me, to reset me, maybe to use the term that some of you have had to maybe even go this week to a chiropractor. I've asked God to adjust me, to put the bones that are out of place back in place, to make sure that the alignment of my my spirit man is right, okay? Because I don't want to miss a solitary thing. We are too close to the end for us just to settle for for the husk that the hogs eat, all right? We are too close, I believe, to this thing winding up and Jesus returning for his church for you and I to do anything other than be at our best, our highest alert, and be aligned and recalibrated to hear every little thing that God has to say. I don't want God to have to scream and holler at me. I want to hear his whispers. I want to be able to look at him and read his eyes so that I'll know what he's about to do. That's called relationship on the court and where you where you are in competition you know the world's competing against everything god wants to do in you the world competes against it you have a lot of players in the world that want everything that god wants to do in your life but i want to tell you it'll take a determined person to hear god let god recalibrate them adjust them so that they may hear the word of the lord to them and i'm going to tell you hell is afraid of a church that has heard God's word and obeys it. I'm going to say it again. Hell is afraid of a church that hears God's word and obeys it. I heard a lot of preaching all my life. I've been raised in church. I had a drug problem, as most of you know. That drug problem was not marijuana, cocaine, heroin, or anything else. I was drugged to church. I'll tell you what, I thank God I got addicted to the, to the source of my high. Amen. And I'm still addicted to that. But God, I've asked God to recalibrate me uh, to, so that everything that he is up to in the church, I am aware of. We are, I'm, as, I'm part of the bride of Christ. You're the bride of Christ. And you and I are called to be attentive to the voice of God. Amen. Pastor Paul set the stage in January as he began to preach on our theme for this year, and that is charge. 
Say it with me. One, two, three. Charge! We were to charge, declaring that we we're to charge forward and do the will of God. And then I heard in that sermon that day, sitting right over here, I heard the unsheathing of a sword in my spirit. If you watched any of the old uh, cowboy shows that had the, have the old uh, uh, Union Army in it, or even the Confederate Army during the Civil War, when they would launch a charge, uh, those in leadership or in command positions, they would unsheathe the sword. And you could hear it. It was like a, a thunder that began to come out of that line of leadership. And I want to tell you today, God did not call us to a backroom relationship with God. God called the church, put it on Main Street, spilled it out into the streets on the day of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Ghost, and signs and wonders followed the church everywhere they went. Oh, my Lord. Do you mind if I dig a little deeper and put some more foundation in this? I used to build bridges. By the way, the reason why they're repairing some of the bridges right now in Indianapolis is because I worked on the construction crew. I had no idea how to build a bridge, but I watched iron workers tie rebar. I watched them put up steel I-beams. I just hauled material around. I thought, my God, if I bring any more, you all are going to have, you're going to waste a lot. Every time I'd go back, the job site would be empty, and I'd have to go get more because they were putting all the material in that bridge. And then they had the audacity to cover it up with concrete. We drove on it for years, but it needed to be repaired. So all I want to say with that illustration is this. No matter how much your foundation has in it, there are times that the Holy Spirit wants to do a resurfacing in your life and a deep repair in your soul. He wants you to possess everything for which you were possessed for. He wants you to do everything which he called you to do. Oh, I should have worn my seatbelt today. Uh, I heard the Lord in my spirit and sheathing the sword in that week of January. A couple of weeks ago, in the morning about 3 o'clock, I woke up to the words of the sound, song uh, in me. I hear the sound of dry bones rattling. That Sunday morning, God of that service and that week, God exploded himself around this altar. And people were saved and people's lives were touched. And how many, how many thank God for the redeeming touch of Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. But I heard that song in my mind as I lay in my bed. And uh, I, I, in fact, I woke up singing, I hear the sound of dry bones rattling. And I do like this. <laughs> That's the rattling of bones. Sometimes you and I need to put into a little bit of action what God's doing. That's all right? Okay, God, adjust me. God, I want you to recalibrate me. I want you to rattle my dry bones. That song is, by the way, taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, the valley of dry bones that the man of God prophesied to. I want to tell you today that that prophetic voice of that prophet that day is not dead, but I believe it still goes forth. And that there is still a prophetic word to the dry bones of, of America and of this world. It's time to come together. I want life back in you. You can settle to be nothing but a, but a, 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 a dried up bone of a skeleton if you want to. But I refuse to live like a skeleton. I have life in me. Woo! The other day somebody... Uh, Wanted to know how long I was going to do what I did. I took my finger and I felt my pulse. I said, well, I guess I'm still supposed to do it. I ain't dead yet. I'm going to do it till I die. I'm going to do it till I die or till the rapture takes place. I'm going to be doing what God wants me to do. I hear the sound of dry bones rattling. Amen. And I challenge you to hear that. I want to take your thoughts with me today to the book of 1 Kings. I want to lay some foundation before I, I read my text. Uh, and this, this story of Elijah did not start in chapter 19. It started way earlier. 
Chapter 18, though, is one of the highlights of this great prophet of God. In that chapter 18, we find that Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to a contest. Jezebel and Ahab had made ruin of the nation. They got the nation of Israel following after other gods. Elijah got fed up. Can I tell you today that one of the fruits of the Holy Ghost is fed up? I'm going to say it again to this bunch. One of the fruits of the Holy Ghost is the fruit of fed up. I'm fed up. I'm fed up living beneath my privilege. I'm fed up living on the low side of the valley. I'm fed up living in defeat and failure. It's time for the church to arise and awaken. Hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Let the wind of God blow on us again and bring our bones back together to where we stand up like a mighty army in the earth today and do the will of our God. God has called us to get fed up. Woo! Mm. How many would like to have the fruit of the Holy Ghost fed up? When the devil tells you you're defeated, say, I'm fed up with you talking to me that way. Hold your hands up to the Lord and say, devil, read my hands. Read my hands. I'm fed up with you. I'm not looking back. I'm not going back. I'm not thinking back. I've got a message. My message is I'm free in Christ. Yes. Yes. Somehow I'm supposed to get all this done in a few minutes. Boy, when you eat at a smorgasbord, how many know you take a little more time at a smorgasbord? How many, how many, can I take a vote? How many like smorgasbords? The rest of you, Jesus, forgive them, Lord. I can tell by most of us, we like to eat. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Elijah's on Mount Carmel. The false prophets of Baal go through this, this, uh, this calisthenic of getting God, their God to answer. They beat themselves. They cut themselves. Aren't you glad God didn't ask you to cut yourself and bleed your blood out in order to hear from him? I think that would really thin out many churches today. Don't you? I'm in this thing for self-preservation and don't I look good. Now, we don't want to beat ourselves. But they did. Trying to get their God to answer by fire. They went all day long and their God never answered. You know why that God did not answer? It's a false God. It's not real. He's not real. So Elijah stepped, came on the scene. He watched them. He taunted them. He probably looked at them. And, and uh, as one's cutting himself, Elijah said, here, let me help you. I'll cut you a little deeper. He didn't know Elijah eventually was going to kill him anyway. But he ends up, Elijah does, stands up. He goes to the altar. He rebuilds the altar. Everybody say, rebuild the altar. He rebuilt the altar. Then he had 12 barrels of water poured over the, over the, the sacrifice uh, after digging a trench around it. He wanted, I tell you, you're talking about an illustrated preacher. He was. Dug a trench around that altar, and then they poured 12 barrels of, of water. It flowed down over the, over the uh, sacrifice. All, the, all of the debris went out into the reservoir of the trench. But it's a soaking wet sacrifice. And then with a short 63-word prayer, you can count them yourself when you have time. 63 words was in that prayer of Elijah. You don't have to pray long, by the way, to get God to hear. You don't have to, you don't have to be exhausting to God because he would like to exhaust your enemy. Amen? So he prays a short 63-word prayer. Fire falls from heaven. It consumes the sacrifice, and then it begins to lick up all the water 
uh, around the trenches. You're talking about a place of scorched earth. It was a place where you, could, where you knew God had showed up. It was almost like the handprint of God touching the earth. And, excuse me. And suddenly, and suddenly, I mean, everybody's attention was at high alert. Elijah then took a sword and he killed 850 false prophets. You talking about a man on a mission. He had a man on a mission. Can I tell you something? Many people, they say, well, wasn't that a little bit harsh? I want to tell you something. I believe that the church, it's time for us to get a little bit of, a little bit of backbone still and stand up and say, devil, I've had enough of you. I'm not going to tolerate you by putting you in handcuffs and locking you away. I'm going to kill you, buddy. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to, I'm, let me say something like this. Let me put it in plain language. Some of you need to get rid of some stuff in your home and some of the things that have been, part, been distracting to you from God. You need to go ahead and put them to death. Amen. If you love them so much, dig you a grave in your backyard and go out there and bury them. Put your little cross up there and says, killed for Jesus. Amen. You can't, can I be a little bit old fashioned? You, you, there's some things that you should never do once you come to Christ. If you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, your new creature can't live on your drugs. Your new creature cannot live on your alcohol consumption. Amen. Amen. Now you say that's old fashioned. You're right. At least you understand English. We need to understand today. There's some things that we have babied and tolerated and coddled till it's almost consumed us as a nation. And it's time for us to put to death the old man. For he's to be crucified every single day. Amen, Brother David. Boy, that's good preaching. Holy water. Does this give me more energy? I watch pastor drinking this all the time. Boy, watch out. <laughs> so he kills 850 prophets of Baal. Chapter 19, verse 2, Ahab in verse 1 goes back to Jezebel and says, oh, Guess what Elijah did? He killed all of them, honey. They're all dead. They're all dead, What are they going to do? Jezebel, by the way, whose name means unknown. And unknown said this about Elijah. He said, be it unto me and more if by this time tomorrow you're not like those prophets of Baal. In other words, you're going to be just as dead as they are. And I'm going to kill you. Now, by the way, when Jezebel got mad, Ahab had never spoke up to her. And Elijah got frightened when he heard this declaration of Jezebel. So there is a, there's a nationwide search out. They, what do they call them? APB? Uh, on, on Elijah. I can see his face in the post office. Wanted, alive, so I can kill him. And, uh, you know, just tell me where he's at. I'm going to get him. Elijah runs. He goes to a mountain range named Horeb, which is about 20 miles away. And so he's running, this man of God. And he begins to run with such desperation that he hardly even knew where he was. But he comes to rest under a juniper tree. And in that juniper, at that juniper tree... He falls asleep with exhaustion. How many of you ever felt like you were exhausted while you were running? I, I, I get exhausted if I try to run literally, all right? Uh, I, I'm not a runner. I'm more of a fast walker, ain't I, Lane? But I'm not a runner. And so uh, you that run, we'll pray for you that you get whatever thirst you have in your life fulfilled. I don't understand it, but that's all right. I don't have to. But I want to say Elijah run. Didn't know why. He didn't understand all that was going on. I've been a great man of God. You, I've done everything God you asked me to do. I even, I even killed false prophets and cleansed the land 
of that, of that prof, pro, false prophet ministry. But I am exhausted. And he collapses under a juniper tree and falls asleep. And most of us know the story. An angel comes, dispatched by God. Angels, are, how many knows that God still has authority over angels? I, do you believe that? you believe that with all your heart? I believe the angels of the Lord encamp around about me because I fear him. Amen. And they don't come just to throw me a party. They come to deliver me from the things that come against me that I don't even know. I believe that. Now you can say that's just a bunch of hype. Well, leave me alone. I believe in it. All right. I trust that. I know his angels have been given charge over me. Not that I can play Russian roulette with a gun. Not that I can jump off some high cliff and do something that is ridiculously dumb. But I want you to know that God has protected me. And I guarantee many of you are alive today only because the protection of God. I'm going to say this. Some of us has done too many dumb things to live this long. Hello. We played with fire and it's been a wonder and a miracle that we didn't get consumed or die in the midst of that fire. It was God. It was God. It was God that delivered and set you free and made you whole. Woo! He collapses, God sends an angel, bakes him a cake. Uh, so he bakes him a cake, wakes him up, and he eats, tells him to rise and eat. Bakes him, and then he falls back asleep. That sounds like some of us. We want to take a nap right after we eat. So he went back to sleep. God gave him some restorative rest, but he still didn't have a lot of clarity in his mind. The angel woke him up again and, and said to him, Arise and eat, for the journey that is before you is too great. God will take you on a greater journey of adventure than you ever thought possible. And so you better eat good at his table. Because he's got good things. He wants to take you to a good place. So he did. And he went on that strength of that meal for 40 days. Now, by the way, if I'm going to know I'm going on a 40-day fast, fill me up. I would, I would visit two or three smorgasbords that day. All right? I'd say, fill me up. 40 days is going to be a long time. I'm just being, being honest with you. I would want to give me a, give me a, you got any candy bars I can eat? Uh, what, what Milky Way and. And all these things, they don't make things for that, are, that are fast approved. So I'd, I'd eat them before. And just like the rest of us, okay? But I want you to know that, that when he came to that place and he collapsed, God knew where he collapsed. You can run, and whenever you get to that place, you're going to run. You're not going to stand. You're going to fall. You're going to collapse. The good news is that God knows where you've collapsed. And so he sends that angel. Now, let's go on. So he comes to a cave. And the Bible said in verse 9, 1 Kings chapter 19, And there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He came to a cave. Let me point out two things. He came to a cave and lodged in it. That word lodge indicates to me he came to a cave and he got comfortable living in the cave. He got comfortable living in the cave. Now I want to tell you, I want to say this and I, I say it with love. Some of you have gotten so used to cave dwelling that you forgot to have a vision for outside the cave. You got comfortable running, being exhausted, doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over that you got comfortable in your cave. 
And if you get comfortable in your cave, you'll lodge there. You'll set up an office there. You'll make a bed there. You'll build a table and eat your meals in that cave. Hello. Some, oh my God, I, I just need to say this today. Some of you got so used to eating in the cave of oppression that you wouldn't know what it would be like any longer to get out and really live life for God. Hallelujah! Yeah. You know, some people are so used to isolation because they wanted to be insulated, they became isolated, and in their isolation, they forgot that God said, go you into all the world and preach the gospel. They forgot that there's a world that God so loved that he gave his only begotten son that if anyone would believe in him, they would not perish but have everlasting life. They forgot that Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. They have simply forgotten the purpose of God in their life. I want to tell some of you cave dwellers today, it's time to get out of your cave. It's time to come out of your cave. Tell your neighbor, it's time for you to get out of your cave. Just tell them, it's time to get out of your cave. He lodged there. He got comfortable. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Some people say, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Say, what? What are you doing here? Sucking your thumb. Whittling on your little stick, not making nothing, just a bunch of fire fodder. You're just kind of in that zone of, I don't care. They don't like me on Mount Carmel anymore. I went to that Mount Carmel church, called fire down, and they made me leave. They didn't make you leave. You ran because you got scared. Hello. If you've not got this part of the message yet, I'm trying to tell you, quit being afraid. Get out of your cave. Get out of your cave. My title today is Commissioned in the Cave. A few weeks ago, I was walking through our house, and uh, I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, Commissioned in the Cave. Commissioned in the Cave. And so I've been eating on this for weeks now. Commissioned. I didn't go there to die. You know, Elijah thought he was going to go in that cave maybe and die. He wasn't sure because he didn't know how long he'd, he'd hang on after eating that cake. But he was running for his life. He wasn't sure what tomorrow held. I'm almost certain he thought his days of prophetic ministry were washed up. I've killed all these people. Now I'm a warning man. I can't show my face in Israel again. I've got to run. So he runs. Oh, my, help me, Lord Jesus. I found in my study that caves are pretty, they're not odd things. There's like 17,000 registered caves in America. 17,000, isn't that amazing? Anybody went to a cave and took your family to a cave? How many of you thought of the Flintstones? <laughs> While you was there. <coughs> I did. My mom and dad took me to Mammoth Cave. I'm so glad they didn't leave me. <laughs> Which proves to me God didn't want me to live in a cave. It didn't take me long to realize, you know, I'm not a cave dweller. Now, caves obviously are, are things that had a purpose. And I'll talk about those purposes in a little bit. But worldwide, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of caves. In Gideon's day, people hid out in the caves and dens while they tried to survive the attack of the Midianites. That's a good place. That's a good thing to be able to have a place to run to for survivalship. Uh, but then, uh, historically as well, caves were used to hide out. They were used to, believe it or not, even bury your dead. Genesis 25, there, what, there's a cave that is mentioned that became the cave of the patriarchs where Sarah and Abraham were buried. Jacob and his wife was buried in that same cave. It's a protected place today. And, and people go there and they, 
They uh, do whatever they do at those caves, all right, visiting the dead. In 1 Samuel chapter 22, David, after being, you know, hated by Saul, threatened with death, ran to a cave called Adullam. And he, and he went to that cave, and he hid in that cave. Now, a cave can be a hiding place. It can be a place of safety. It can be a place of burial. When you, in fact, read on, in, in, uh, let me just mention this quickly. In John 11, verse 38, Jesus, when he went to Lazarus's, uh, uh, we'll call it his, his wake, his sisters met him and were crying. And so he asked them the question in verse 34, where have you laid him? In verse 38, Jesus stood at that grave site and he was groaning in himself. He came to the grave and the Bible says it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. How many knows what Jesus said after that? Take a guess. Remove the stone. Remove the stone. Some of us have wanted to keep some people in the, in the cave so long that we don't want to remove their stone. We want them to stay in there. Can I tell you that God's going to send people into the church world today that, yeah, they smell like death, but God wants the church to roll the stone away and let them come forth. Amen. Amen. You know, if you, get, if you make everybody jump through your hoops and your loops and, 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 and do all the checkoff lists that you think's got to be done, there ain't nobody going to be fit to do anything, including you. This, amen. amen. This church, this church has been built on love. It's been built on love, acceptance, and forgiveness. It's been built on receiving people Believing that God is doing a great work in them, and no matter where they've been or what they've done, when you come into Christ, He makes you a new creature and begins to write a brand new story in your life. You don't have to live in the past. And I want to say this to every old timer and believer here that's been saved for a lot of years. Maybe more years than some people have even been alive. It's time for you to throw away your scorecard. It's the truth anyway. I've learned to love people. Some people I had to learn to love. Amen. It did not come natural. Hello. But I'll tell you what, God can help you love people. God can help you forgive people. Amen. And so God calls us to do that. So in that cave, he said, I want you to roll away the stone. Church, it's time we roll away the stone. Everybody you see that's dead in Christ, remember they have a stone in front of them. It's time for you in your love and in your mercy and prayer Begin to roll the stone away. Begin to love, accept, and forgive them. You might be surprised when they end up sitting next to you in church and they look at you and say, I'd never believed I'd be here, but here I am. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. There ought to be a stone rollers club in the church. Amen. Roll the stone away. Jesus don't like you living in that cave. That's why he said, when they said, don't you know, uh, they, uh, if you'd been here, you'd live. He said, don't you know I'm the resurrection and the life? He that believed in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Oh, all that Lazarus was waiting on for somebody was to roll the stone away. For somebody to say, Lazarus, come on out of there. Come on out of there. Huh. Oh. I'm trying to get through. What time is it, by the way? Time for me to preach? Jacqueline, I don't, I'm not sorry. I'm just. Uh, David, David, when he ran from Saul, let me get back to that story. He goes to a cave called Adullam. Uh, and, uh, 
And, and when his, and his brothers and his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. But guess who else followed? In verse 2 of, of 1 Samuel chapter 22, and everyone, if I say everyone, everyone, who was in distress. And then it said, and everyone, if I say everyone, everyone. who was in debt. Boy, what a great group. And everyone, if I say everyone, everyone, who was bitter in soul. Wow. Everyone that was in distress, in debt. How I many know? You know the number one reason why couples argue today in America is debt, is money? Can you imagine some of the bickering that went on and some of the things that men said? They had 600 men that showed up and they're talking about their wives who go out and spend all their money. So they're, they're, they're disenfranchised from family and they're upset. By the way, men have spending problems too. I believe in equal time. Pam, did you say help him, Lord? Everyone who's in distress, everyone who's in debt, everyone who's in bitterness of soul, bitter in their soul, that means they are so upset they can't live with themselves, so they run away. Hey, Amen. I'm going to tell you what, no matter where you run, I don't care if it's into alcoholism, drug addiction, pornography, you ain't going to run away from bitterness of soul. Hello. You're not going to get away from debt or distress. It's going to be there. But David, the psalmist of Israel, called by God, <coughs> God's testimony of David was, he's a man after my heart. Yes. David wrote songs to the Lord that touched the heart of God, and David rejoiced, over, over, uh, rejoiced in the Lord, and God rejoiced over David. David didn't worship like this. David's worshiping like this. I'm a funnel God. Pour everything you've got into my life. I want everything. Give me it all, God. Don't, don't let a drop spill over. I'm opening wide my funnel so you can just pour everything in me. And I want to tell you, church, David was a man that had to run because of a threat on his life. These other men run because they just were unhappy where they were. It doesn't matter why you run. Many times we all run into a cave and we are exhausted. We are fearful. We are distressed. We're in debt. And some of us are even bitter in our soul. But the good news is God has a way of turning your, your cave of destruction into a place, a brand new deployment where God deploys you out of your cave. Yeah. Now, back to 1 Kings 19. I said all that to say this. Why didn't you say that first? Because you, it, you wouldn't have enjoyed it near as much. And I wouldn't have had as much fun. So Elijah is in this cave. And uh, he's come there. He's lodging there. And it went on to say that he lodged there. Verse 9 again. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Now where was he? Somebody tell me. Where was he? In his cave. That doesn't mean his secret hideout of the guy's God. Not his cave. Not his man cave. All right? He's in a cave. Caves that were usually dark, no lighting. They were dingy. They smelled, many of them smelled of sulfur, by the way, coming up from the depths of the earth. And so it stunk inside there. And if there was an animal in there that had crawled in there and died, guess what? You get these nice odors of a dead animal. Isn't that just sweet? Anybody bought any of that from Cincy lately? Dead animal smell? <laughs> said the word of the Lord came to him in the cave and said to him, what are you doing here? Said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? I didn't make you for the cave. I made you to be a prophet. I made you to be a mouthpiece. I made you to speak up for me. 
I made you to be my voice. There's some of you that God has ordained to be his voice. It's time that you find your voice of God so that you can speak for God and quit being quiet about him. You and I have a mandate from God to be out loud and to be boisterous and vocal for God. We let everybody else, we let everybody else march. We let everybody else do a lot of different things. Speak up and be heard. It's time that the church gets out of their cave. It's time we feel the commissioning of the Holy Spirit that's given by the Word of God that says, come out of that cave. I've got a new assignment for you. Oh, my God. You may not realize it, but when Elijah went in that cave for hiding, it was also a cave doesn't only have to be places you hide things, it can be places where you find things. It's not just for hiding, it's also for finding. There's treasures you can find in the cave. 1946, 47, and years after that, for a long time, there was an archaeological discovery north of the, Red, of the Dead Sea, up in the mountains. It was discovered by a little boy who was taking care of his family's goats, and they began to wander off. He, he had them all but one, and then he spotted a cave up on the side of this mountain, and he took a rock, and he threw in that cave, and he thought he'd hear a thud, but he heard the breaking of pottery. It scared him. And he took off running thinking he had awakened some evil spirit because he was not expecting the sound. That's like, that's like bumping up against your mama's china closet and something precious falling over and breaking. And she said, why were you rust housing over there anyway? Right? So, the next day he gets one of his buddies and they go back up to that mountain. They decide they're going to go in that cave. And when they got in that cave, they found clay jars that were about this tall. And they opened them up. They seen one that had been busted by his rock. And it had a, had a scroll inside of it. And they had several of those play, clay pots in there. And they opened them up. And inside each of them was a precious scroll. And on those scrolls was the beginning history of the, of, of the world in a sense. We have, we have the first five books of the Bible on what's called the Dead Sea Scrolls. There, 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 it was amazing, that discovery. And for years, they kept digging and digging and unearthing things. They found eventually 900 pots that had scrolls in them. Can I tell you, they found the place to hide something. Until 1946, a little boy throwing a rock, thinking he's going to run a a, a stray goat out of that cave throws a rock up in there and lo and behold there are the there are the first five books of the old testament it was a proven fact that you could not deny god god had hidden those things all of those years can i tell you that god sometimes will allow you to go into a cave periodically just for a little while and then there's a word of the lord that will begin to seek you out and find you in that isolation of the cave. And that word will begin to stir up inside of you. That word will begin to come forth in you. I want to tell you today, you and I need to understand God has a word for you in your dilemma, in your situation. He has a word. He has a word. And one word from God will make you go bear hunting with a switch, charge hell with a thimble full of water, kill all the bears you can drag home and have all the water you can drink. I want to tell you, God's desire is to move in your life and commission you from the cave where you are. Yeah. Musicians, come. Let me quickly wrap this up. 
Well, maybe not. Oh, that's only page two. <laughs> Where is the cave that you have found yourself at today? What cave of despair have you found yourself kind of entrapped in? Maybe it's the cave of failures, the cave where you have disappointed yourself and failed even yourself when you drove a stake in the ground and said, I'm never going to do that again. Be honest with yourself. How many have ever done it again? When you said, I'll never do it again. I remember as a little boy praying at the old altar in the old sanctuary. I was probably nine, ten years old. Very wise, very, very elder from my kindergarten years. But I remember kneeling at that altar. It was an old wooden oak bench. But I remember praying this prayer and saying, God, would you happen to have any more mercy for a person like me? Is there any more mercy or have I exhausted your grace? Has anybody ever felt that way? Boy, I have. Oh, God, thank God I didn't exhaust his mercy and I didn't exhaust his grace. And some are here today in that cave where you've hidden for years, that cave where you've made bad decisions, and bad decisions lead to more bad decisions, that lead to more bad decisions usually, and then leads to more bad decisions. And the will of God is that you hear his voice in the midst of that darkened, damp, smelly cave that you have inhabited, and he wants you to hear the voice of the Lord that says, come out of that cave. I've got a new word for you. You'll find that when you study this out, and read it for yourself in chapter 19 that there were three assignments that were given to Elijah. Elijah was told, go anoint uh, Haziel to be king. Go anoint Jehu to be a king. And then go anoint Elisha the Tishpite to be the prophet in your stead. I want you to, in other words, anoint your successor. What God told him in that one little statement was someday you're going to be gone and somebody needs to carry on that work. Can I tell moms and dads today, it's time for you to get out of your cave where you have not lived right for God and begin to live right for lo the Lord so that you can be the mother and the father that your children need you to be, leading them, <laughs> leading them. It's more, it's, you got to do more. You've got to do more than just bring people to church. You got to be the church. You got to have Christ setting in your home. You got to let him change your method of behavior in your life to where your children look at you and they say, I know my mom and dad love the Lord. Yeah. In our class Wednesday night, they got me teaching, by the way, the gifts of the Spirit to the kids. And uh, in our class on Wednesday night, we, had, we were talking about the gift of faith and the gift of miracles. These are power gifts. And we were talking about them, and I shared some instances where I've seen miracles, experienced them myself, seen them in our church, and began to kind of catalog some of those things. And I remember when we got ready to close Wednesday night, I said, We're, we want to pray. I believe it was little, you have a daughter, Jeff, Mariah, that wanted us to pray because she had an allergy. Well, I said, well, we're going to pray for Mariah. And then there was another little girl who said, would you pray for my mommy and daddy? And so I, I, I found out later that the reason why that little girl wanted us to pray for her mom and daddy, because her mom and daddy were fighting, and they, they were near divorce, and she wanted mom and daddy to not separate. She wanted them to, to stay together, and she wanted their lives to be changed. I've prayed all week for that little girl's mother and father. I've never met them. But can I tell you, whatever cave they're in, the word of the Lord can come to them in that cave this morning. The word of the Lord can come there. And, that, and the Lord can speak to their heart. I want to tell you, you don't have to be looking for God. He's always looking for you. Oh, you need to hear that. Can I say that again? You may not be looking for God but he's always looked for you. You may not be wanting him, but he wants you. He's put an APB out for you where he says, I want you. 
So whatever cave you've lived in this week, whatever cave you've been living in this year, whatever cave you've lived in the last 10 years, it's time to get out of your cave. But you need a fresh word from God, and that word is come out. I've given you an assignment. Elijah was not expecting a word from God. But Elijah is doing what a good son did in that day. He's plowing with his father's yoke of oxen. And in the field, Elijah found him. And he just brushed him with his mantle. Something came all over Elisha. And he said, what have you done? Let me, let, me, let me go with you. He said, what have I done to you? I've only touched you with my mantle. There's something in that holy anointing touch that makes people thirsty for the rest of their life. I'm going to tell you, if you get the drink in the right water, it won't have a cap on it. It'll flow. It'll flow. It'll flow. If you drink from the right water, it'll be fresh. It'll be pure. It'll flow. The reason why I act like I act, live like I live, is because I'm still drinking from the water. Not this bottle. I got a drink from a well one day to where I, he said, if I drink from it, I'd never thirst again. My life has never been the same since I was 16 years old. God literally transformed my life. I have no regrets. I'd turn around, I'd salute and say, Lord, I'll walk right back through everything I've lived through and, and, and preached through and pastored through. I'd do it all again. You know why? Because there is a well of life that springs up in me that doesn't stop. I want to tell you today, I am not a cave dweller. I have decided to come out of the cave. I've decided. Touches. Jesus touches. God release a commissioning anointing in this place right now. To everyone in this place. God, I pray the Holy Spirit begin to settle. God, sit down next to them. Get right in their lap. God, whisper in their ear right now that word that they are being commissioned from the cave. They're being commissioned from the cave. They're called out of darkness into your marvelous light. They're called out of hopelessness and despair, Lord, to abundant life in Jesus. God, move now. Move in hearts and lives right now. In researching this, I got to looking at how warships are commissioned. Some of you have been used to being just a canoe or a paddle boat. God's going to commission some of you to be a warship. I want you to hear this. Whenever they get ready to commission a warship, to go out and defend our nation, be a part of a huge battle fleet, it's a huge ceremony. These are done at some of our cities that have naval shipyards in them. But they have this huge ceremony. There's this great big band playing. There's all kinds of celebration. Fighter jets sometimes will fly overhead and they'll have some dignitary there to name the ship in a formal ceremony. And they will release that ship from the dry dock. But the command comes before they do that is this great command. Someone in authority will stand up at a microphone and say, man our ship and bring her to life. Until it gets into the water, it's just a boat, a ship that's been built, not fulfilling the reason it was built for. It's in dry dock. Some of you have been in dry dock. Some of you have been there. You've been propped up by religion. You've been propped up by a lot of things in your success, failures, all of these things. 
But I want to tell you today, there's a commander that lives in this church and a commander named Jesus Christ that lives inside me. I want to tell you, it's time to man your ship and bring it to life. Quit settling for failure. Quit settling for less than what God wants you to be. Quit hiding in the cave. Start finding your new purpose. Realize that God has ordained this day in Jesus' name. I want you to stand to your feet. This is going to be a little bit different, but I just feel like giving a mass altar call. I feel like just challenging many of you need to, you heard God today. You've heard about you being in the cave. You want to come out. You've made that decision for Christ to come into your heart. Thank God for it. But I want to tell you, it's time now to not just hear his voice, but now follow his voice. But now follow his voice. Brother, I don't know your name. Bill. Bill, you're my new best friend. All right? You inspire me, Bill. I'm going to tell you why you inspire me. I know people who are just too lazy to stand up. But I noticed you're in a wheelchair. I'm not bringing attention to, to the loss of your lower leg. What I'm saying, I'm bringing attention to your inspiration. Can I tell every one of us here today, why would we dare sit when God says stand up and come out? Come out! Come out! Get out of the cave! I would open up this altar. Some of you are going to come and you're going to kneel. Some of you are going to come and stand. But I'm telling you today, God commissions you in your cave. And he tells you to find your voice. Hear his word. Get your voice behind his word. And go forth declaring the will of God to others in Jesus' name. Let's come. Let's seal this in prayer. Let's believe God today. Come on. Let's believe God today. God, I don't want to sit in my cave. I don't want to be content. I don't want to be content. Oh, hallelujah. 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 God, move around this altar today. God, set captives free. Melt away. Melt away. God, the barriers to change. And darkness just as you burn to the cords off of the Hebrew children. At his voice. Lord, it trembles at burn his the cords voice. of bondage off. Set them free. Set them free. Sing.